So we're on the record. Does the state, Mr. Bell, have another witness? Yes, Your Honor. State of call, Dr. Andrea Weems, to the stand. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear you will testify to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you out? I do. Kindly have a seat here. You can speak in the microphone. Would you expect, Mr. Bell, that you're going to go into photographs with Dr. Weems? I do, Judge. Thank you. For those of you who are spectators here, sometime this afternoon there are going to be autopsy photographs. I expect that most of the lawyers and other participants, including me, have seen autopsy photos before and are not unused to the sight of them. I expect, however, that many of you haven't seen such photos before, and I expect that some of you know the people depicted in the photo. Nevertheless, kindly, if you would, restrain your emotions. At least don't make them audible, if you will, so as not to interfere with what's happening here in the court. The second thing I want to say for the participants is we're likely to go, well, as late as we can tonight to get this witness concluded, meaning don't necessarily assume we're going to be out of here at 5. And third, on a related subject, of course, I can't force this Mr. D'Angelo, Mr. Mack, or Mr. Shaughnessy, but if you want to stipulate to the doctor's qualifications, that may cut down on 10 or 20 minutes of testimony. And like I said, I can't force it, but... Absolutely, we're going to stipulate to your qualifications. So if you want to, you may still want to ask some questions. You may not at your discretion, but if they're going to stipulate, we can at least shorten that portion. Thank you, Judge. I'll try to take that. All right, so thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Doctor. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Could you please state your name for our court reporter? Dr. Andrea Weems, W-I-E-N-S. And would you please spell your last name? You did. Now, how you spell, you pronounce your first name, Andrea, is that correct? Yes. And you're working where at the present time? I work at the Oklahoma Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Okay, for how long? Since October of 2013. Okay, prior to that? Prior to that, I was a forensic pathology fellow here in Cleveland. How long were you a fellow, and what is a fellow? I was a fellow for one year. Fellowship training is specialized pathology training that follows a residency in pathology. I actually did a separate fellowship in neuropathology before doing my forensic pathology fellowship, but it's a specialized training that follows medical school and residency training. Okay, so you were a certified doctor in the state of Ohio? Yes. Undergraduate school, where did you go? I did my undergraduate coursework at Southern Illinois University. And received what type of degree? I received a bachelor's degree in biology. And do you have a master's degree as well? I do. And what is that? Zoology. Okay, and you did your Ph.D. level work then, is that correct? I did. And did you teach high school chemistry, biology, and physics for five years? I did. You went to medical school then, and where was that? I went to medical school at the University of North Texas Health Science Center, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Okay, so you did an anatomic pathology residency. Is that the one that you were talking about? Yes. And that was where? That anatomic pathology residency was at Ball Memorial Hospital. Can you say that name again? Ball Memorial Hospital, B-A-L-L, in Muncie, Indiana. And two years of neuropathology, is that correct? Correct. And where at? Two years of neuropathology fellowship training was at Indiana University. And then comes the one year of forensic pathology here, is that correct? Correct. Who was your teacher or trainer here, as you were calling him? Dr. Joseph Filo was the fellowship director. He was a deputy medical examiner, is that correct? Correct. All right, still does that work, is that correct? Yes. You've kept in touch with him? Yes. How many autopsies have you performed yourself? Throughout my career, I've performed 704 autopsies. Okay. 
and that includes in Cleveland as well? Yes. Right? How many in Cleveland? Uh, in Cleveland, during my year here, I performed 234 autopsies. Many of them gunshot wounds? Yes. All right, so once you have a, uh, a fellowship in Cleveland, was there a protocol for review of the work that you did? Yes, as a fellow, all of my uh, work was approved and supervised by a physician at the medical examiner's office. It was not always Dr. Filo, but there was always a supervisor. And for the incident or issue that we're going to be talking about today, it was Dr. Filo, is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> and when you do make a report of an autopsy, does Dr. Filo review that report? He was the person that was your trainer. Correct, yes. And is it also signed off by the medical examiner for Cuyahoga County in the state of Oregon? Yes. So turning you now to the autopsy of Timothy Russell, uh, were you present and did you conduct the autopsy on November 30th, <laughs> December 1st, I should say, of 2012? Yes, I conducted the autopsy on Timothy Russell. Sure. We're showing you the state's exhibit. 1,050, you recognize this, Doctor? Yes. Okay, and what is that? State's Exhibit 1050 is my report of autopsy, including a first page with a list of anatomic diagnoses, which is signed by the medical examiner and me. Pages 1 through 10 following are my written report of autopsy findings. And the final page is the medical examiner's verdict, which is um, created by office personnel and the chief medical examiner. Uh, Dr. Gilson, is that correct? Yes, Dr. Gilson. Signed off by him and was that? Yes. And showing you what's up on the Mondo uh, pad right now, is that the same thing? Yes. This is your report, correct? Yes. During the autopsy of Timothy Russell, who was present? Uh, Dr. Filo was present, and two police officers were present, Scott Gardner and Kevin Harvey. Okay. The East Cleveland Police Department? Yes. And Dr. Filo was responsible for the oversight of the autopsy? Yes. Prior to the autopsy, were you at the crime scene? I was. On what day? Um, I believe it was the previous day prior to autopsy. Okay. Uh, you recall being called out, called at home uh, to go to uh, a place where the bodies were, is that correct? Yes. Would that be Heritage Middle School in East Cleveland? Yes. And uh, who was there at that time? Uh, Dr. Filo went with me and one of our uh, death scene investigators was also with us and there were several police and OSBI agents there. About what time of the day was it? Uh, it was early in the morning, daylight, about 8 a.m. Can you turn to page one of that exhibit 1050, entitled uh, Gross Anatomic Description? You see that area? Yes. It says that you were viewed this initially at the scene, is that correct? Yes. You were not the field of the press, is that correct? Yes. Was there a photographer there from your Office. There was a, a death scene investigator with a camera, yes. And they're responsible for taking pictures and documenting the scene at that time? Correct. And have you reviewed those photographs? I have. Can approach the witness chart? Of course. Thank you. Dr. Shown, you states exhibit number 1019. That's 1019 through 1040. Have you reviewed these prior to testifying here today? Yes. Okay. 
Would you please take a look through them again? Uh, you saw those earlier today, is that correct? <coughs> yes. And do those exhibits in front of you accurately reflect the way that the scene appeared to you when you were there from 8 a.m. on? Yes. Uh, some of these photos are not from the scene. Okay. Tell us which ones. Photos 1033, or sorry, States Exhibit 1033 through 1040 were um, photographs that were taken after the car was moved back to our facility. Okay, so we'll talk about those in a minute. So. 1019 through 1032 were pictures from the scene, correct? Yes. Are you depicted in those? Um, yes, I am in States Exhibit 1021 and 1022. Okay. Is this be you here? Yes. Okay. And who else is present with you? Dr. Philo. And I believe the man standing to my left in that photo, whose face is not visible, is our death scene investigator, Mike. Okay. And um, another agent, is that correct? Yes. I'm, I'm not sure who that other person is. All right. This is what, uh, uh, you have something in your hand there. What is that? Um, a notepad. Okay. You were taking notes during this period of time? Yes. And uh, had other law enforcement in, been there prior to you being there? Yes. Showing you states exhibit 983. Does this accurately depict what you saw at the scene at the time that you were there? Yes. Okay. And then showing you states exhibits 11 and 1197. 1,199, the attachments of these state's exhibits. Please review those. So 1197, attachment O, doctor. See that picture that was uh, yes. provided? Appears to be a cell phone picture, correct? It's it's a picture of Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams in the vehicle. It's blurry, but approximately in the same positions that were viewed by me at the scene. Okay, and the same as the other exhibit as well. Yes. Eleven ninety nine. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. During your autopsy, how many wounds did you notice or shots, gunshot wounds in Timothy Russell? Timothy Russell had 23 gunshot wounds. Were x-rays taken? 
Yes. When the body is brought to the coroner's office, what's the normal procedure? What happens? Um, when, a, when a person arrives at the medical examiner's office, they are um, received in a sealed body bag. The bag is opened, photograph <laughs> is taken. Before I perform my portion of the postmortem exam, which is the autopsy, trace evidence scientists will examine the clothing, collect anything they need off the body for their uh, particular testing, remove the clothing, take their own photographs. X-rays will be performed prior to my autopsy examination. Um, and then I will examine the body outside first and inside to look for evidence of injury or natural disease processes that could be responsible for death. Showing you states it's 1033 through 1040 now. Do you recognize where these pictures were taken? Yes. States exhibits 1033. through 1040 were, um, are, they are photographs that were taken in the bay at our facility. Okay. Were Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams' bodies brought to the facility in the car? Yes, they were. Do you recognize those pictures as being pictures at the bay that morning? Did you review their bodies being taken out of the car? I was not present when Timothy was removed from the vehicle, no. Where did you first see their bodies? At the scene. Okay. And then afterwards, when was the first time you saw their bodies at the medical examiner's office? It would have been the next morning after he had been removed from the vehicle. Okay. And would he have been uh, processed already at that time? Yes. Okay. By process. I assume Mr. Bell means Curtis Jones had done his work. Correct. Do you understand that? Yes. Pardon my interruption. Thank you. <clears throat> I think he testified to, during the processing also that x-rays would be taken, is that right? Yes. Prior to you uh, performing the autopsy, is that right? Right. <clears throat> Showing you states exhibits 966 through 981 recognize these as being the 15 x-ray photographs. Yes, states exhibits 966 through 981 are uh, X-ray images of Timothy Russell. When you first start performing the autopsy, what is it that you do when you get the body? I'm sorry? What do you do when you get the body? My uh, first examination of the body begins with an external examination to include um, characteristics such as skin color, hair color, eye color, height, weight, um, just sort of general features of the person, any identifying scars or tattoos maybe that they have, um, and any documentation of medical therapy that may be on the person if they um, are treated by EMS or at a hospital before they come to us. And then I look for evidence of injury and natural disease on the outside of the body before looking for those same things on the inside of the body. And did you do that in this case? Yes. Okay. Now, once you did that, uh, where do you first start uh, looking for wounds? Um, well, generally, I move from head to toe in, in general, and in, that's what I did for Timothy Russell. And what are penetrating wounds? A penetrating wound is a, a penetrating gunshot wound is a gunshot wound in which the projectile enters the body but does not leave the body. So a, a projectile is recovered. So in general, as you said, you start at the top. And yes. You did that in this case. 
wound number one then, would that be the first wound that you examined and reported in your autopsy? Uh, correct. Wound number one is the first wound that is described in my autopsy report. It does not mean that wound number one was the first wound received by the decedent. Okay. Understood. So, on the left side of the screen here is your report of your autopsy, page one. When the bodies are first processed, they come in and uh, with the clothes still on, correct? Yes. Okay. Are those called dirty pictures? Yes. Okay, because it's before the bodies are cleaned up and correct. processed for you to review, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, showing you state's exhibit number 962, would that be how the body was first brought to you in the dirty picture state? Yes. And you've seen that before, is that correct? Yes. Is that Timothy Russell, the person that you performed the autopsy on? Yes. Okay. Following onward, did you uh, have a situation that you review the body after it had been cleaned up, that is, uh, with the clothes taken off and with the some of the blood removed from the face. Yes. Shawnee State's exhibit number 963, is this that, uh, depict that uh, situation? Yes, this is a photo of Timothy Russell with clothing removed. You said you had uh, 23 shots. Would you have known that at the time that you were looking at it to begin with at this point? No. Perform the autopsy first, is that correct? Yes. Showing you states exhibit 964 and 965. Uh, can you tell us about uh, these wounds? Is, uh, is wound number one depicted in 964 and 965? Yes, states exhibits 964 and 965 document wounds number one and two of my autopsy report. In this photograph that's being shown, 965, Wound number one is the wound towards the left on the top of the head, and wound number two is toward the bottom right in this photograph. So following what you just said, I'll point out wound number one is to the upper left, is that correct? Yes. Right left, and wound number two is down towards the right. Yes. Now the head's been shaved at this time, correct? Yes. Why is that? Um, when there are wounds that are covered by hair, sometimes it is necessary to remove the hair in order to better characterize and see and photograph and document the injury. What did you document in your report as far as wound number one is concerned? The wound at the upper left of the state's exhibit one, <clears throat> Wound number one enters the top left scalp you're pointing on the top of your head? Right? Yes. Okay. Um, less than one inch left of the midline. All right. And um, right in the middle, at the top. It enters the head, goes through the brain, causes bleeding within the brain and within the um, spaces around the brain perforates the middle cranial fossa, which is the base of the skull, just above the middle ear on the left side, and ends in the uh, temporomandibular joint on the left, from which a uh, bullet fragment is recovered and a separate uh, sliver of probable jacket is recovered. Two pieces are recovered from this joint. Okay, so you're pointing, tell me if I have this right, to the top of the midline is, correct? Yes. And comes down, and then the pellet is uh, on the left side, is that correct? Yes. Okay. When would you have been able to recover the pellet? Would you have to go into the, the cranium and uh, pull off the upper part of the, the skin to the head to do that? Yes. So. As part of the autopsy, the brain is removed, um, and this w these fragments of bullet would not have been recovered until after the brain was 
out of the cranial cavity. And that information is brought to you when you examine. Is that correct? Do you see the brain afterwards? I do. Okay. And do you see the fragments that were, that were discovered? Yes. Okay. And you follow the wound path? Is that yes. Correct? And you make note, is that right? Yes. So everything that you just testified to with the wound path, would that be in your autopsy report? Yes. Okay. Now, would that be on the next page there? It is spanning pages one and two, where um, letter C, injuries. Yes. On your page one, and then three, four, five, little six, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, is this wound anti-mortem? Yes. Okay. And what is anti-mortem? Anti-mortem is a wound that is received before death. Um, Anti-mortem wounds are hemorrhagic. There is bleeding associated with wounds because the heart is still beating at that time. And this wound has bleeding and bruising of the brain associated with the wound track, indicating that Timothy Russell was alive when this bullet projectile passed through his brain. Okay. So you know that because of the hemorrhaging in the wound path itself and the brain contusions that were caused, is that correct? Correct. So anti-mortem, that's also been called by others pre-mortem, is that right? Yes. It's pre-death, he's alive, correct? Right? Is, is that correct? Yes. So the projectile recovery, can you tell us where the projectile was recovered? There were two pieces recovered from the uh, left temporal mandibular joint and maxilla, which is this bone that comes across and is your cheekbone, sort of underneath here. So in this area of the face. All right. For the record, you're pointing to your face on the left side of your cheekbone. Now the trajectory, which, how was the trajectory? The trajectory of this wound number one is downward toward the left starts on the left, but it moves more toward the left and back to front because it starts near the midline top of the head and the projectile pellets are recovered closer to the anterior face. Okay. Now, what is the anatomic uh, position? These words are all describing uh, the trajectory as if Timothy Russell is standing straight up with his head being the topmost and his feet being the bottommost, and his, may I stand? Sure. <clears throat> um, anatomic position with the hands down at the sides, palms forward. So this kind of standard anatomic position would be how all of my trajectories are described, as if, as if he were in this position. Okay. So laying down on the gurney as well, just that's what the trajectory position is. So when you say back to front on your big E trajectory line, you don't mean that the trajectory hit him back to front, you're saying that's in the anatomical position. In anatomic position, that's the bullet path, yes. Looking at uh, room number two, this is Shown on the state's exhibit number 965, you directed me down here to this area, correct? Yes. And wound number two, how did you document that? Wound number two is also a penetrating gunshot wound of the head. It enters the right scalp, right posterior scalp, about two inches to the right of midline and two inches down from the top of the head. The projectile moves in a downward and also forward position like or trajectory like wound number one. It injures the brain and the bullet fragment is recovered from the left petrous ridge, which is a bony ridge above the left middle ear at the base of the skull. This bullet injures the brainstem, which 
harbors your respiratory centers and your heart rate centers, and um, there is hemorrhage associated with this wound as well. But the location of this injury indicates that very soon after this bullet passes through the brain, Timothy Russell is no longer breathing and his heart is not beating anymore. This is a nearly immediate death. Okay. Is this wound anti-mortal? It is. So pre-death? Yes. He's alive at the time that this wound is inflicted? Correct. Again, this uh, wound here, that's a head wound to the top of the head. And you explain the trajectory. I'm going to hand you two pens here. I want to make sure that the record's clear. Uh, putting one on top of your head or one on one of those. Could you do that, please? Show the floor. For the trajectory? Uh, wound number one. Mm -hmm. Now, please uh, add in wound number two from your examination of the path. Is that correct? Very light. Can you see them? I, I can see them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, both coming up kind of in a, in a V fashion for the record, correct? With number two being slightly off to the, to the right. Is that correct? Yes. Again, both are in a downward trajectory, is that right? Yes. And from the anatomical position, from back to front, right? Yes. Is there a uh, difference between the words lethal and fatal, or do you use those words interchangeably? Um, they have essentially the same meaning. I would use them interchangeably. They, to me, indicate um, ability to cause death, lethal, fatal. They're similar words. Uh, you viewed a mannequin before that depicts Timothy Russell, is that correct? Yes. You were not the person that put trajectory rods into the mannequin, is that correct? I was not. I believe you had shown us with the pens uh, the trajectory, is correct? Yes. Uh, you're the one that performed the autopsy, is that right? Yes. And you've seen the mannequin as it is today, is that correct? Yes. And you've seen other pictures of it as well, is that right? Yes. Showing you uh, now a little portal for the record, the State's Exhibit 27, the mannequin. Uh, that is something uh, that you've seen before. The trajectory rods are there. Uh, having performed the autopsy yourself, uh, what's the, does it accurately depict how wounds one and two were in the bullet pads? The trajectory rod for wound number one is where I would place it. it this one that's sticking out of the right side of the head wound for two. wound number two, I would have placed that at a at a steeper angle if I place these rods myself. Okay. Is the... Just come down? Okay. Sure. As you're coming down, Doctor, I'm asking you a question. Is the entrance to where number two is correct? Uh, yes. It's above the, the right ear. Okay where the right ear would be. Please join me down here. Number 27. Uh, so this would be placed differently if you were placing it. Um, this rod, maybe Please. Is, I would have placed the trajectory more at an angle like 
this okay. pattern, just at a steeper angle. With your left hand, can you show again where the bullet wounds are coming from? Um, um, number two. So it's hard to demonstrate because sure. it's on the inside of the head, but if the ear is sort of here where number one is, the projectile is inside the head from there, sort of behind the, the left eyeball. So, kind of like that. And you've used bad things before? I have not. Okay. This is the first time that yes. you've used them So this would be a different position. Uh, I'm showing you, please take this, uh, stay back. The do yeah, doctor, as long as we, and by we, I mean everybody, especially those including the court reporters, can hear you, you may testify from there or from the stand. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so keeping uh, you with us down here on the floor, States Exhibit 982, which is showing on the map. Could you go over to the board and show us where the pellet is on wound number one, where it would be covered? Explain the trajectory. Uh, for wound number one? Correct. The projectile fragments were recovered in sort of this area. Okay. And, and the path? relatively in line with the trajectory rod that is that is there. Yep. Okay. Tracing it backwards. Okay. Is it ready to draw? Yes, sir. Ms. Barnett, why don't you go on to the green? It's going from this circle to this yellow in line with this trajectory rod. Well, down to the circle. Correct, down to the circle. It's not as easy to draw a straight line. There we go. We're doing it this morning. There we go. All right. Award number two, then. Could you show us the more exact placement of the rod you were placing? Um, the projectile for wound number two would be. Is there anything in the head other than the skull that's capable of 
deflecting the bullet or changing its path? No. Is the skull capable of doing that? Yes. Pardon my honor. Thank you. Okay, so rule number two, it was also anti mortem. Is that correct? Yes. And hemorrhagic? Yes. But uh, it would cause death uh, relatively immediately. Is that correct? Yes. Within how long? A short couple seconds. And how about uh, wound number one? Approximately how long would that take just in and of itself? To cause death? That's correct. Uh, in the absence of any other wounds, wound number one could, could take several minutes for one to expire from wound number one. Wound number one is likely immediately incapacitating, but not necessarily immediately fatal. Could you drive after wound number one? Probably not, no. Steer? No. Accelerate? No. May I interrupt? Yes, sir. However, wound number one is a person certain to die from it. Without treatment, yes. Well, because the impact and trajectory through the brain, although it did not hit a vital structure in the brain, would have, if given time, caused brain swelling and subsequent anoxic injury to the brain. So without treatment, wound number one likely would be fatal within minutes. So who or what kind of person with what kind of abilities would have had to have been there how soon? I understand this is hypothetical because there are more wounds than just number one, but would have had to have been there within how soon so that Mr. Russell wouldn't have died from number one? In other words, somebody more more than just somebody versed in first aid? Oh yes, he would have needed an OR. Okay, not, not even an EMT. Probably would not have been sufficient, no. He would have needed immediate hospital attention. Okay. Um, pardon my interruption of your direct examination, Mr. Bell. Thank you. So, wound number one as wound number two is fatal, is that correct? Yes, without treatment, yes, yes. And it could be several uh, minutes that somebody could survive. Wound well, number one. Right. Yes. Could it be as little as one minute? Sure. Could it be as most as three minutes? Could be. What about something longer, a half hour? Oh, um, not likely. Looking at uh, the man, would there be any other changes to the trajectory rods that you would have made that you would place in your eyes? Um, just with maybe the steepness, the the steep angle of most of those that are number 15, yes. particularly 15E. Um, just at a, a slightly steeper angle, perhaps. So even, but, even steeper than what's depicted here? Yes, because 15E has characteristics that are slightly different from the others. It's a very tangential shot. And I'll point to the correct route. Yes. Again, for the record, it states exhibit 982 on the screen, pointing to the correct route. Is that correct? Yes. Right. So rule number three now, uh, do you have that in your report in front of you? Yes. Okay, so that would be page two of uh, exhibit 1050. Where is this one on the bottom? 
Wound number three is on the left neck. Okay. Anchoring point on your on your body there, on the left side of the, of the neck. Okay. What's uh, significant about this wound? Um, this wound is a superficial wound. The bullet fragment um, enters the skin and doesn't travel very far underneath the skin tissues, but with the bullet fragment, there is a white fuzzy, gray-white fuzzy material embedded with the bullet fragment. Other than that, the, this is not a lethal injury. Looking at State's Exhibit 989, you see this? Can you see it from there? Yes. It blow up? If you could um, expand the portion of the picture from the ear toward the table. Yes. Other way. There you go. Yes. See that left neck piece of fuzzy, yes, yes. That, that is the fuzzy material <coughs> that is embedded in the wound with the projectile. You pull the projectile out of there? Yes. Okay. Is there uh, documentation or a way to know if that was uh, penetrated at that position? Was it a panic? Exiting wound as well, or no? This is an entrance with no associated exit. The bullet went into the skin and subcutaneous soft tissues for a short distance and was recovered from there. Okay. Do you know where the cause came from? I do. I did not at the time. I know now. And this uh, trajectory, from what uh, angle was it? Uh, it's it's very short under the skin, so it is listed just as left to right. It doesn't really deviate up, down. Left to right, and you noted that in, in your report, correct? Yes. Have you reviewed the uh, trace evidence uh, photographs of, uh, of the clothing in this case? I have. <coughs> Ten thirty-six. Isn't 1036 of the Malibu in her Emmy's garage? photograph of the jacket that Melissa Williams was wearing and there are defects in the external material of the jacket, the black material, and there is white fuzzy material coming out through those defects. Okay. Those 
checks the jacket. I'm showing you. Approaching the whips again. Sure. Showing you, Dr. Uh, piece of clothing, you recognize this from the photographs that you have reviewed before, specifically 884. Yes, case This is state's exhibit number 81 for the record. Uh, do you recognize it as being the item that you've reviewed before in 84? Yes. Okay. Have you also seen this personally? That, that is exhibit 81. Yes. The material that you found embedded in the neck of Timothy Russell, did you also uh, take note of the material here in State's Exhibit 81? Yes. Okay. Is it consistent uh, from your observance? I observe it to be consistent, yes. And reviewing the wound on the neck, <laughs> that you've pointed out to us, Timothy Russell. What accounts for that embedding of that material? What position is Timothy Russell in during that period of time? In order for fuzzy material from Melissa Williams' coat to be embedded with a projectile in Timothy Russell's neck, the projectile must have first passed through her jacket before it entered his neck, and it carried with it some of that white, gray-white fuzzy material. So that indicates that he was behind her with his head turned facing the passenger door. If that makes sense. Okay. And if you could come down from the standing, please, Doctor. Showing you State's Exhibit 1036. <coughs> Is the jacket Exhibit 81 depicted in 1036? Yes. Okay. Can you point to us the material that you're talking about uh, from the jacket? These holes on the left. <coughs> sleeve of the jacket and the left upper back of the jacket have some, sorry, some of the fuzzy material visible in this photograph that, her, that appears to be coming out of those defects. Showing you states exhibit 81, are those uh, defects noted here? Can you point out those? Well, there are several, yes. Yeah. Some of them have yellow tags pointing to them which would have been placed on this garment by our trace of these people. Thank you, Doctor. Please take this hand. Thank you. Now, wound number four, Doctor, is a penetrating uh, gunshot wound. Is that correct? Wound number four is a penetrating wound, yes. Okay. And again, by penetrating, you mean? Penetrating means the projectile entered the body and did not exit. What can you tell us about this wound here? Wound number four enters the midline upper chest, just above the sternal notch, which is, if you can see my necklace, that's an approximate location of where my necklace is, right here in the front of my neck. Yes. Um, yes, there we go. So depicted is State's Exhibit 987? Correct. Okay. The projectile enters. As it enters, it causes abrasions of the chin. Yes, which you are pointing to. There are two of them. The bullet fractures the left clavicle and is recovered from the soft tissues above the left clavicle. And these scrapes on the underneath part of the chin indicate that as the projectile enters, his chin is down. Can you show the court, please? 
So in order for there to be injuries associated here, his chin is down. Thank you. Thank you. And you may notice this in your report under 4A, little i and i i, is that correct? Yes. These are the abrasions that you know that are in the picture that you had before you, is that correct? Correct. And those are associated with that wound before? Yes. And as you said that, you're saying that indicates his face or his head was downward, is that correct? Yes. Does that support the wound number one and wound number two? The entrance wounds on the top of the head as being forward trajectory shots? Um, yes, if, if the head is down, then these two wounds would be from a, an elevated position to Timothy's right. Okay. Wound number, uh, <coughs> by the way, is this a, uh, is this a lethal shot that we're looking at? Or? No. Wound number five, then, in your report. Wound number five is another penetrating wound, meaning the projectile enters the body and does not exit. It is of the uh, distal clavicle. So wound, wound number four was the proximal clavicle, so it's closer to the midline. Distal meaning further away. And that projectile enters the joint of the left shoulder, and the projectile fragment is recovered from that shoulder joint. This is depicted in State's Exhibit 988. No. Chest photo? Yeah, that's the it's not in that photo. Okay. <clears throat> Showing you a state's exhibit 960. Mm X-ray, is that correct? Correct. Is the wound number five, the penetrating gunshot, uh, depicted in that? The projectile fragment in the left shoulder is evident in the in State's Exhibit 968. Would this be one of the brighter white colors that we're seeing? Yes. White. Okay, now where, uh, which one? Uh, up top or bottom of the thing? Um, there are three at the top. Yes. The, that third one you pointed to. Yes, that one. Now, showing you States Exhibit 988B, for the record. This is the one that you're talking about and depicted in this picture. Yes, it would be the wound that is furthest to the right in this image. In this image, just for um, orientation, the paper with the number written on it, yes. it, to the right of that paper would be his shoulder and head. Okay. To the left of that paper would be his abdomen and then further on down his feet. Okay. So the defect that is furthest to the right, correct that is the wound that would correspond to wound number five. Wound five, okay. Again, this is a, is this a non-lethal, non-fatal shot, is that correct? Correct. It's right to left, is that correct? Yes. And the uh, forward or backward, what is it? It is front to back. Okay. Now, wound number six in your reports you have that listed as a penetrating gunshot wound at the right mid upper chest in your report, is that correct? Yes. Is this a 
lethal shot or a non-lethal shot? Wound number six is a potentially lethal shot because of the location of the projectile when it is recovered, where it, where it ended its path. <coughs> you say potentially lethal, does that mean that it could kill, but it's not known? Right. It, this, this injury by itself could have caused death. But I don't know if it did cause death because there are other injuries that are definitively lethal. And we've spoken about those already. A couple of them, yes. So Wolf one and Wolf two, is that correct? Right. Well, I, you know, I hate to interrupt either side. But on the other hand, when a question occurs, sometimes it's nice to ask it then. This wound alone, would it kill somebody? It could. Or it could What not. would make it not kill a person? Immediate intervention? No. Um, the, the mechanism, so this, this projectile did not injure the heart physically. It did not penetrate it, tear it open, anything like that. Okay. But the projectile fragment was behind the sternum which is the, the breastplate. So mm -hmm. it enters the chest cavity and the bullet isn't the only thing that's there. There's also, you know, gases and other things that come through, or even in this case, it may have just been the bullet, the kinetic energy of the bullet. As it comes to rest, it's transferring its energy to the tissues around it. Right. So potentially it could have resulted in an arrhythmia of the heart because of its location, but not because it tore the heart open. Does that make sense? Yes. And is there a way to detect, in this case, whether it did in fact cause an arrhythmia? No, because an arrhythmia is a physiologic electrical right. phenomenon that I cannot detect at autopsy. And, and the that holds true whether this had been the only bullet or one of uh, 23. Exactly. Right. Pardon my interruption. Yes, Judge. Thank you. And thank you, Doctor. Uh, this wound, uh, potentially lethal, as you said, or fatal, both words could be used interchangeably. Not downward, is that correct? Downward, yes. And the path of it? S uh, right to left and front to back. Right to left, front to back. Yes. Correct. Yes. And again, I'm not sure if I asked you, but could you show with your hands how that uh, how it goes across your body? Downward. Thank you. And then wound number seven. Listed in your report, there is a penetrated gunshot wound of the left anterior mid upper chest, correct? Yes. Okay, that's uh, page three of your report. All right. Showing you states exhibit 988B. Is the wound depicted in this exhibit? Yes. Okay, which one is it? Um, on the paper where it is written IN 12-2023, yes. it's below the 20. Yes, to the left of the 20. Right. I have that correct? Correct. Okay. So for the record, it's right where you said, under the 12, it's uh, to the right of the left nipple. Is that right? Yes. Right. <coughs> what is IN-12-2023? That is the case number for Timothy Russell. When each when each um, decedent comes to our office, a number is assigned that follows that person throughout all of their paperwork and photographs. And this number is the number that was assigned for Timothy Russell. Okay. Now, is this a non-lethal, non-fatal? Correct. This just injures skin and soft tissue. It does not enter the chest cavity. It's superficial. Yes. At the path of this, can you explain that to us uh, for us on your report? Is this a leftward path? 
This is a leftward path, yes. There, the autopsy report is incorrect on number 7E. It is a downward and front to back trajectory, but it should say leftward instead of left to right. It is actually a right to left trajectory. So on your report, uh, it 1050, downward, you should say leftward, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then can you explain that for us by standing up? When you say leftward, uh, and okay. you said right to left, correct? Yes. So it travels in the direction I'm pointing, downward, yes. leftward, and front to back. Okay. So it is actually a, it's a right to left wound, but it's on the left side. Of the body. Is that correct? Yes. So that's what you mean by left. Leftward, yes. Okay, thank you. And then number eight, that wound. It's listed in your report as a penetrating gunshot wound with a left lateral mid chest. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Showing you states exhibit 988B. And we're on page three of exhibit 1050. Tell us about this wound. This wound is depicted in 988B as the defect that is the near the bottom most portion of the image, sort of in the middle of the picture. Um, it enters the left lateral chest and travels downward, also leftward, and front to back, like number seven. And also like number seven, it does not enter the chest cavity, and it is a superficial wound that just injures skin and subcutaneous soft tissue. Understood. States uh, Exhibit uh, 1050, page 4, we're going to turn to. Your wound number 9, perforating gunshot wound at the left face. May I interrupt you, Mr. Yes. Bell? Why don't we uh, take a break and resume after that break with wound number 9. So, uh, Doctor, you remain on the road, and you have to return to the stand in about 15 minutes. You're welcome to step down there. Uh, Spectators and all others in the courtroom, thank you for uh, maintaining appropriate courtroom decorum, and we'll see.